first, let me introduce myself. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Nancy Cordes. I'm the Chief White House Correspondent at CBS News, and I want to thank you for joining Shore Rivers for the annual State of the Rivers event. I'm very excited to be your MC this evening. I'm coming to you from the beautiful Y River, which still takes my breath away every time I look at it. And like you, I have this well of gratitude to Shore Rivers for everything that they do to preserve and improve waterways like this one on the Eastern Shore. It's so amazing to be able to see with the naked eye the impact that they are having. I'm just very, very honored to be in their company tonight and to join them as they share with you the stories of these rivers over the past year. Um, a few logistics before we dive into conversations with some of my favorite, favorite friends of the river. Um, you're all muted right now and your video is turned off and this is to make sure that the program runs as safely as possible. Throughout the program though, please send your questions to me or the river keepers in the chat box here in Zoom. And at the end of the presentation, the river keepers and I will do our best to answer as many of those questions as we can. Now, we've all gathered tonight because we share a deep appreciation for our rivers. And we know that so many of you have turned to your local rivers and streams and parks for rejuvenation over the past year. And with your help, Shore Rivers really persisted in protecting and restoring Eastern Shore waterways through science-based advocacy, restoration, and education. Tonight, you're going to hear from the four Shore Rivers River Keepers. They're gonna tell us about the health and the challenges of our local waterways and what we can all do to ensure that progress continues. Remember to send your questions to them in the chat box so we can answer them after the presentation. There really is no one else who knows more about these waterways than the four of them. Uh, so now, river keepers, uh, I would ask that you please tell us about the state of our rivers. I want to start with Matt Fuda, who is the Chop Tank River Keeper and the Director of River Keeper Programs. Take it away, Matt. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you so much. I just want to say it's so comforting to know that even on national broadcast television, you have technical challenges, uh, just like we're experiencing a little bit here today. But uh, no problem. If there's one thing the Shore Rivers team knows uh, how to do really well, it's to solve problems. Uh, and that's what we're going to be here to talk to you a little bit about today, uh, the health of our waterways and how we're addressing the problems that we're identifying um, through our water quality monitoring. So welcome everyone to the State of the Rivers, our 2020 uh, preview of the, the water quality data that we collected last year. Um, before I get started, I just wanna set the stage and explain a little bit of background to, to lead into the other river keepers talk. Um, the 2020 monitoring season was one of perseverance in the face of uncertainty, no doubt. Our team was faced with difficult decisions at every turn as we navigated the world of COVID-19 regulations and precautions. The first challenge was how to conduct our monitoring. Uh, with keeping our volunteers and our staff safe was our top priority. This, this left us with a tough decision to conduct a modified sampling program in 2020, leaving us unable to activate our volunteers. The second challenge that we dealt with was with our swimmable shore rivers bacteria monitoring program. Early in the pandemic, we, faced with, we were faced with quarantining at home and social distancing and our parks and public spaces and our water access points became essential for people's mental and physical well-being. And visitation rates increased dramatically across the state and especially here on the Eastern Shore. Meanwhile, we're learning that the coronavirus could be detected in wastewater discharges, posing a new health threat to those accessing the public spaces that were supposed to offer healing during these times. As a result, we worked hard to get our monitoring program up and running early in order to provide our communities with the data to know where a potential wastewater discharge may be impacting local waterways. The second challenge that we were faced with uh, dealt specifically with our swimmable shore rivers bacteria monitoring program. Oh, I'm sorry, the second, the third challenge that we were faced with was one that was uncertain for us all. And um, I'm sorry, are you seeing the right screen here? I believe so. So the um, the third challenge that we were faced with is one that we're still still dealing with and is um, irregular for our state of the rivers process. But because of the the COVID-19 pandemic and some of the delays in the labs that we use to monitor and, and process our water quality samples, we unfortunately don't have a full suite of results for all the parameters that we'll be um, usually put into our report cards. But nonetheless, 
for those of you that are attending the, the State of the Rivers today, you'll receive the full report card in your mail once we get it completed and sent out. Um, but what we are excited to talk to you about is what we did see on our rivers in 2020, which was definitely a, a, um, an interesting year on many aspects. So before we get started on the chop tank specifically, I just want to lay a little bit of groundwork on what exactly are we collecting and where are we collecting it. So the monitor, monitoring the, the water quality that we're talking about today was collected specifically in our tidal segments of our rivers. And you'll see here the, uh, the monitoring stations within each of our, our river segments. Uh, we're testing specifically for the parameters of dissolved oxygen, chlorophyll A, water clarity, and phosphorus and nitrogen. Today, we're gonna to touch on those top three parameters as we're still waiting the results of the phosphorus and nitrogen uh, analysis that we, that we sent to the lab. And then lastly, how often are we testing? We're on these rivers at least twice a month, hitting every one of these spots, collecting water quality data. And we do that from April through October. So as that sets the stage for, for what it is that we're collecting and where we're doing it, I'd like to now dive into the Chop Tank River here. For the next three slides, you're gonna see a very similar map that you see here, colored in according to the grade of this parameter for that specific area uh, in the Chop Tank. The first parameter we're gonna talk about here is dissolved oxygen. And I'm excited to show that most of the river is green for dissolved oxygen, which is a good score. You'll see the, 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 the Bay Health scale listed on the bottom there, going from green with an A to red with an F. Now the lower Chop Tank River scored an 83%, which is an A minus, and the upper Chop Tank River scored a 70%, which is a B. I will say that generally dissolved oxygen was good in the, in the Chop Tank River, as you can see here, but the lowest dissolved oxygen score that we did receive was at Easton Point uh, with a 33% score. And the upper Chop Tank River saw relatively low dissolved oxygen readings as well. When you compare those to 2019, all the scores got worse between 2019 and 2020, showing that there was a, a change in the dissolved oxygen levels between those two years. Moving over to chlorophyll A, this is a parameter that indicates how much algae is in the system. You'll see here that we do have some color variation throughout the chop tank, meaning that it wasn't as consistent as dissolved oxygen, which had a good score all throughout the rivers. But in fact, we had other hot spots here of, of high chlorophyll A readings, which is an indicator again of high algae. So the lower chop tank river scored a 65%, which is a B minus, and the upper chop tank river um, scored an A minus with an 83%. And again, the areas with the lowest score for chlorophyll A was Easton Point, once again, with a 43%, and then Latrap and Island Creek scored a 55%. I will say that compared to previous years, Broad Creek showed the only score that decreased between 2019 and 2020. And the biggest improvements were noted in the mouth of the Chop Tank River with 23% and Island Creek, 29%. Switching over to water clarity where the picture gets a little nasty looking here with all the color that we see throughout the river. Water clarity across the board was poor in 2020 um, around the Chop Tank River. The areas with the lowest score for um, water clarity again was Easton Point. Uh, again, the, the, the middle and the upper parts of the Chop Tank River saw challenges related to those water, uh, water clarity scores. But as you'll see here, the, the only place that did improve in water clarity uh, was the mouth of the chop tank where we do have a little bit of green there. Um, and so generally the dissolved, dissolved, dissolved oxygen was good. The, the chlorophyll was pretty good, but, but still um, worse from 2019. And then the water clarity was worse throughout the entire river system. Switching gears a little bit now to our swimmable shore rivers bacteria monitoring program. So this is the program that I talked about where we're testing for bacteria levels in the river and had a, a heightened sense of urgency during the pandemic once we learned that the COVID-19 virus was able to be detected in sewage and wastewater discharges. So once we heard that, we started our program a couple of weeks early so we could get our communities the information they need to determine whether or not it's safe to swim in these local swimming areas. Um, what you're seeing on the map here is all the stations that we, that we sample bacteria for um, throughout the Chop Tank River. And the colors indicate which sites passed 
less than 60% of the time, which is Crafts Park in Denton and Hambrook's Bay Beach, which I want to dive into a little bit more here. Looking specifically at Denton, you'll see this graph and, and the threshold, the, the, the threshold to meet the water quality standard for recreational swimming at this site is 104 units. And that's indicated by the red dashed line on the graph there. And you'll notice that at Krauss Park in Denton, the, the samples failed to meet water quality standards all throughout the month of June and all throughout the month of August. And even one sample in August was um, above our detection limit for what we were, we were able, to, able to read. Switching over to Hambrook's Bay Beach, the, uh, this is a, a beach located right outside of Cambridge. And the picture here gets a, a little worse, as you can see here, that the, the station only met water quality samples 31% of the time. You can see the high readings that we see consistently um, at this station, which is very troubling for a lot of people that recreate in this waterway. But what this has allowed us to do is investigate what are these bacteria sources that are impacting our local waters. And I'm happy to announce that as we move into 2021, we're gonna be looking at ways that we can source track where this bacteria is coming from. So then we can start to address those sources um, right at the point of, of when they're entering the water. Now, this is all interesting because when we look at the bacteria monitoring, we're really trying to focus in areas where people are accessing the river, where kids are swimming in our waterways and potentially splashing uh, water in their mouth where they can ingest it. And what this really relates to is how our communities are accessing our rivers. We learned through the COVID-19 pandemic that our public spaces and our natural resources are more important than ever, especially during the time of a public health crisis. And we saw that in, throughout the state of Maryland, um, public spaces saw a 45% increase in visitation from 2020 to 2019. Now that made us wonder, is access to our waterways equitable across the entire watershed? Well, let's take a deeper dive into that. This map here is one that, that represents an analysis that shows what is the need of our communities to have public access sites within one mile of walking distance. Now we have to be considerate that not everybody is able to drive or, or take their boat to these areas, but we all are able to walk to these areas, which is really important. And so the areas that are indicated in red show a very high need of public access in those regions, whereas the areas in green have more access available for the residents that live there. So as we continue to think about um, how do we include all of our communities in the mission to protect and restore our waterways? We want to make sure that all of our communities have access to our waterways because we know that public access fuels stewardship. And with stewardship, we can work together and achieve our vision of, of healthy waterways across Maryland's eastern shore. So we're going to continue to work on making sure that our public and all of our communities are able to get to the river and enjoy them the way that we would all like to. Now, touching on the, the last two parts here, I want to jump to the habitat. I cannot talk about the Choptank River in 2020 without mentioning the abundance of underwater grasses that we saw in early spring. The photograph on the right here was taken at Legates Cove, and this is horn pond weed literally growing from bank to bank in this cove, so thick that you can see boat traffic or boat scars moving through the grass because there's no way around it. Um, this is an encouraging sign. We know that underwa underwater grasses are important and a good indicator of the health of our rivers. I don't want to take up too much time talking about SAV because I know Ellie, our resident SAV queen, is going to really highlight the, the results and the progress that we've seen on the eastern shore with underwater grasses in our rivers. But I will say, just take in that picture for a moment. and Let's hope that we can continue to see these um, underwater grasses thrive like they did early in the spring of last year. Now, lastly, habitat on the Choptank River cannot be talked about without mentioning the oysters. The Choptank River is home to three of the state's five large-scale oyster restoration sanctuaries, which are indicated on the map here, Harris Creek, the Treadavon River, and the Little Choptank River. Harris Creek and the Little Choptank have completed initial restoration phases, and the results so far are promising. We're seeing that the, the, the metrics for a successful restoration are being met in both of those areas, and we can continue to hope to, to see that moving forward. Now, the Treadavon River Sanctuary is actually in progress to complete restoration this spring, and currently 
If you find your way on the water in the Tredavon River, you'll see a barge actually planting substrate that's going to form the base of where these oysters will be planted in that river to help restore the population. So get out there and see that if you can. And then secondly, take a look at the photo at the top left there. That is oysters pulled out of Harris Creek for studying that show a large amount of baby oysters growing on them. 2020 was a remarkable year in the Choptank River for oyster reproduction. And this is great news because after 2018 and 2019 and the, the high, um, the, the, the large amount of rain and the, the freshwater flows that resulted in that, we did not see a lot of reproduction of oysters in the Choptank River um, those two years. But in 2020, we saw them rebound. We saw the oysters reproduce. And for that, we can hope that the population continues to thrive and, and to grow from that point. So thank you for, for tuning in for the Chop Tank. Um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Nancy, who's gonna introduce you to the rest of the river keepers. Wow, well, thank you so Matt, much, Matt. It was uh, really exciting to see those oysters uh, and to see the underwater grasses. What many of you probably already know about Matt is that he is a really powerful advocate for the river when it comes to land use permits and their impact on water quality. And he's also taken a leading role in oyster restoration, fighting for a sustainable fishery in the chop tank and throughout the Chesapeake Bay. And uh, one other thing you may not know about him is that when he's not taking his daily swims in the chop tank, he is teaching his two-year-old to be an avid river lover as well, along with mentoring his fellow river keepers. So thank you so much to you, Matt. Um, and to anyone who is just now joining us on audio, we apologize for the delay. Just know that all of this is being recorded, so you will be able to go back and watch anything that you missed at the top of the presentation. Before we get to our next Riverkeeper, though, uh, I want to introduce a very special portion of our presentation tonight. Uh, the Shore Rivers Award for Environmental Stewardship is presented to an individual or entity in the Chesapeake Bay watershed in recognition of their transformational accomplishment as a steward of the environment. In 2019, you might remember, we presented the inaugural award to Ann Swanson, a pivotal leader in the Chesapeake Bay restoration movement and executive director of the Chesapeake Bay Commission. Well, as you probably know, she was a catalyst for the early formation of two of the three legacy organizations that merged to become Shore Rivers in 2017. And so it is my pleasure to turn it over to Anne to present this year's award. Um, let me first say that listening to the water keepers really makes you realize that just like it takes a village to raise a child, it really takes a large village to restore rivers. And so it is an incredible honor for me to be here uh, to talk to you tonight, Nancy, to meet and work with you and to all the board members and the staff and the friends of Shore Rivers. Shore Rivers is such a rock solid organization doing such important work and receiving its first environmental stewardship award uh, was really honestly one of the greatest recognitions of my life. And so at this point now, I am so relieved to have this microphone to be able to turn to honor another uh, an absolutely extraordinary man, Nick Carter. Uh, Nick's comments do not scratch the surface of who Nick Carter is. And in my short time, I'm just going to try to explain a little bit of Nick. Um, first of all, more than 50 years ago, Nick and Margaret, his remarkable wife of 59 years, 60 in October, bought 33 acres of cornfield and scraggly woods in the upper reaches of the Chop Tank watershed near Red Bridges. And they built a modest home and many people build modest homes. But what they did was otherwise very different. They didn't mow, they didn't plow, cut, pave, fertilize, nothing for half a century. They just stood back for 50 years and watched it regrow. And if you've gone to that property, it is a natural wonderland. They have inventoried 84 species of birds, seven different turtles, eight varieties of snakes, a dozen or more frog, toad, and salamander species, 
and more than 200 native plants. And the plants have terrific names, things like rattlesnake plantain, lady slipper, partridge pea, and maybe my favorite, witch's butter. And Nick's poems, they reflect that property's magic and they reflect his reverence for the natural world. Now, professionally, Nick spent 35 years at DNR. Most knew him as the agency's biologist. He'll tell you he was a biologist. But the agency organized and reorganized many times. In fact, it probably organized and reorganized again while we've been on this call. But Nick served in many divisions, held many titles, and served many masters. Right, Nick? But, you know, in the end, as I was preparing this, none of this detail matters. What matters is what Nick did. Nick, regardless of title or division, Nick's job was to review projects and to think through solutions. His stance was absolutely unwavering. He was to keep people from screwing up the ecosystems. He'd tell you that time and time again. He wrote strong positions, he stood his ground, and he made sure that that agency, his damn agency, did the right thing. And leadership at DNR used to cringe when they saw him coming. They used to say, oh my God, here comes Nick with the bad news. Well, DNR needed to understand small detail, and Nick could think small. But when DNR needed to think really big, Nick was a visionary. It was Nick Carter who thought of Poplar Island. It was Nick's name that was placed on the DNR library. So I've told you a little bit about where Nick lives. I've told you who he's married to. Uh, and I've told you a little bit about him professionally. But who is Nick Carter? Who is Nick Carter? And I really grappled with this. First of all, he is brilliant. Nick is a synthesizer. He's an extraordinarily complex thinker, and his friends and colleagues have actually likened him to E.O. Wilson or David, David Attenborough. They say he's the Attenborough of the Bay. Who else do you know who would be described that way? When many of us learn something and we we learn it and we can spit it back as fact but the thing that's so different about nick is that nick can take disparate pieces of information biology ecology hydrology uh, history politics sociology he can take all these facts and then he weaves them together in a common understanding that becomes new knowledge He's told you something new, not just regurgitated the facts. Now, Nick, with that skill, is an expert communicator. And he takes students from Salisbury University and the Master Gardeners Program and basically anyone he can in the field. Because Nick can talk to anyone. He can talk any age, any education level, and any political persuasion. And he believes deep down that everyone has an entry point. Everyone has a place where they can learn and listen. You just need to find it. And Nick's skill is finding it. Now, I, it would not be complete if I stopped there, because I have to tell you that Nick is irascible. He is tenacious. He's fun. And if I had to think of an animal, he's probably a coyote because he's a schemer. He's really, really a thinker, and he knows how to play chess well to get to the goal that he wants to get to. But Nick is also, he is giving, he is kind, and he is selfless. Now, when you look at what to do when you're giving an award, the internet will tell you to use a quote. Well, Socrates said, an unexamined life is not worth living. Socrates would have liked Nick Carter. In fact, we all like Nick Carter. 
And the organizing committee talked about opening the microphones at this point in the program, Nick, to allow everyone to clap. And we concluded that noise would be deafening. And so the Zoom would crash. And we couldn't take that risk. So that's why tonight, instead, we just wanted everyone to do a virtual clap and essentially just tell you how much we appreciate you. The award that you've been given tonight is made by a local artist. His name is Steve Green. And Steve's bowl comes from a native Eastern, Eastern Black Walnut tree that was felled in a storm on the Lee family farm next to one of your favorite fishing holes on the Y. What's special about this tree is that the family planted the tree in 1980, not only for ecological benefits, but for, quite honestly, it was an investment to support their grandchildren's education. Eastern black walnuts are strong and stately. They love to be near the water. And this one was planted by a family with love for future stewards of our rivers. That tree, that Eastern black walnut, is just like you, Nick. Shore Rivers is very proud to honor you tonight for your service and your absolute lifelong commitment to the environment. Thank you, Nick. I say a great deal more than I deserve. Thank you so much. <laughs> I really uh, am honored here much more than anything I deserve. Uh, to receive this stewardship recognition. I can, I can only say that, uh, particularly with regard to a lot of people who checked in and listening, I, I've been extraordinarily lucky in my life. I've been able to do work both at Fisheries DNR and with, uh, with the uh, Shore Rivers that, uh, it has been significant and been satisfying, been uh, worthwhile, and yet at the same time, uh, it's something I've enjoyed doing thoroughly. So you, it, it could hardly be called work. Uh, I've been blessed a lot with my wife, Margaret. She has uh, shown me the importance and the beauty of uh, planning and planting for biodiversity. She has uh, shown me the importance of uh, planting for, for pollinator support. She has supported and contributed to everything I've tried to do, both in my professional life and uh, in the little bit of environmental education efforts that I've done since. And she has uh, supported and contributed to our efforts to reforest a little bit of the chop tank that the water she had. And similarly, we've been very lucky in that our children approve of what we have been trying to do for these 50 plus years. Uh, I've met a lot of good friends, a lot of colleagues that, uh, that know the importance of conservation. Uh, a lot of these people have wonderfully, uh, articulately demonstrated the, the kind of knowledge and belief that they have shown me. Uh, I particularly want to mention uh, Tim Junkin and Tom Horton, Dave Harp, and Sandy Cannon Brown. Uh, I've been able to work with a lot of people uh, that have understood, that, that grasped the understandings of nature that have enriched my life. Anne Swanson and her husband, Derek. Uh, Tom Horton, 
Day or Dave, uh, Suzanne Sullivan, Ellie Bassett, uh, Jeff and Beth Horseman, Diane Stecker and Ed Dryden, uh, John Gill from Fish and Wildlife Service, Ed, uh, Leslie Grudnan, our planner in Caroline, and Lori Lorstaber and Ken Staber. Uh, and people that worked with me all the while. I was at Fisheries, Harley Spear, uh, Steve Early, Dale Weinrich, John Foster, and Don Ball. So all of these people have understood and supported what I take to be the most important guidance in conservation, and I'm particularly referring to uh, Aldo Leopold's land ethic. Uh, got to recommend, if you haven't read Sand County and the land ethic, you have to. And also, uh, I need to mention the, some of the instruction I've gotten from a Dr. W.C. Loudermill used to work for SCS back in the 30s and 40s. Now it's NRCS. He uh, expresses better and more succinctly than anybody else I know uh, what he calls the 11th commandment. And I feel obliged to share that with you. He said uh, in 1937, Thou shalt inherit the holy earth as a faithful steward, conserving its resources and productivity from generation to generation. Thou shalt safeguard thy fields from soil erosion, prevent thy living waters from drying up, protect thy hills from overgrazing by thy herds, protect thy forest from despoliation, that thy descendants may have abundance for help. If any shall fail in the stewardship of the land, thy descendants shall decrease and live in poverty or perish from off the face of the earth. And promoting Dr. Loudermilk's, Dr. Loudermilk's philosophy, promoting Aldo Leopold's land ethic. This is what we've all been engaged in, and this is what we must continue to do in the restoration of our rivers here. So these are the influences and the people that I've been privileged to work with and I could have asked no more out of life. So thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Nick. If only we could hear everyone who is on this Zoom, I'm sure the applause would be deafening. Uh, it would probably break the, <laughs> break, break the Zoom presentation, but uh, I know that uh, everyone is so moved by your words. You are truly a legend and a living lesson about the importance and the promise of conservation and stewardship. So thank you so much. Congratulations. I was just talking to a friend today who was lucky enough to get a tour of the chop tank not long ago from Nick. They were on his boat and they were going up the chop tank. They got as far as they could go until they got into shallow water. When he stopped, he opened a cooler, pulled out some white wine, some beer, some crackers and cheese and some pork rinds and they sat there happily chomping their pork rinds together talking about the river and conservation and stewardship and uh, he is a he is a has an encyclopedic knowledge of that river as I'm sure many of you know and it was a an unforgettable afternoon for her and I know many people who are on this call have had unforgettable experiences like that with Nick Carter so Thanks again to you, Nick. Well-deserved. 
We are now going to go back to our presentations from Riverkeepers. We're going to go next to Ellie Bassett, who is the Riverkeeper for the Miles River and the Mighty Y. Take it away, Ellie. Thank you, Nancy. It's great to see you joining live from the Y. Um, I am also joining virtually from the Y, but before I begin, you know, I want to also congratulate Nick. You know, as Nancy said, we have all had an experience similar to what Matt has had, and um, he really is a legend, and many of the books on my shelf in my office come from Nick. So, Nick, thank you again for everything that you've done. I consider myself really lucky to, um, you know, call you a friend and a colleague. So, Let's jump into the Miles Y data. So um, thank you again, Nancy, for introducing me. I, I am Ellie Bassett. I'm your Miles Y Riverkeeper. We are going to dive in to our data on the Miles Y. This is a group who, uh, believe it or not, choose to swim around the entire Y Island every year. They are getting ready to gear up for this in the coming weeks. So this is why we do the work that we do, right? We are working towards swimmable, fishable rivers. Let's take a look at what that looks like this past year. This is a really colorful slide, but what I like to see is, you know, the difference between last year and, and the year before that. So how have the rivers changed within this year? So we are looking at uh, our dissolved oxygen clarity and our chlorophyll A. And I wanna go through and look at each of our complexes here. Eastern Bay generally usually uh, scores better out of compared to all of our, our waterways on shore rivers. And that's mainly because it is an open body of water. It's open to the Chesapeake Bay, so it receives really well flushing throughout the year. And it also has a much smaller land to water ratio. So we're not getting as much runoff from Kent Island as we would say the upper portions of the Y River. So because of that, you can see that generally Eastern Bay scores fairly well. We did see a decline in uh, oxygen in Eastern Bay and chlorophyll A. Um, however, I will say that the winners this year, and I know I have a few past water testers on who are, will be happy to hear this, Cox Creek was our best performing uh, um, tributary comparatively to all of our other rivers in this complex. So that is new this year. Cox Creek has, has not seen such a good year as it had last year. So that's good news. Shifting over to the Y. Um, again, we are seeing as we travel upstream, we're going to see poorer water quality. So you can see here, we saw again another decline in oxygen. However, we saw an improvement in algae, which is really encouraging. Algae tends to be really um, prolific on the Y and, and Y narrows and Y east in particular. We see a spring tide of mahogany tide, and then we see a late uh, bloom as well near August. And we saw an improvement in clarity or in chlorophyll this year in the Y, which is really encouraging. Jumping down to the miles, we saw an improvement in all three parameters, which is fantastic. And particularly, I wanna point out that the middle of the miles, we have two sample sites in these two spots right here in the middle of the miles, we saw a significant improvement in oxygen, clarity, and chlorophyll A. So that is a good win for the miles. As you can see from this visual, again, as we travel upstream, our, our water quality is gonna, gonna go down. It's gonna become poorer. And this is a good reminder that what we're doing on the land is gonna impact what happens in our river. To me, this is a really good opportunity because this means that we can do something to turn this around, right? This means that we can do in the ground projects, restoration that's gonna directly result in better water quality, which is very exciting. Taking a look at our bacteria data, uh, as you can see, this is kind of similar to what Matt's map, map looks like. Um, generally, a lot of these sites passed a majority of the time. And what we saw this past summer was we had a bit of a dry summer in the beginning, um, and then we got a lot of rain towards the end of the, of the summer season and into the fall. Claiborne Cove in particular, also called Broad Cove, uh, had our poorest water quality for bacteria. And I want to remind everyone that before you go swimming, check the weather. Uh, are some of the golden rules here, you don't want to swim after a major rain event because that's when bacteria can be at its highest. You never want to swim with any open cuts or wounds. Uh, you always want to rinse after you swim. And in general, you want to check swim guide to see if uh, we monitor that location. 
Something I also want to point out here, you can see that we're a bit lacking here in Kent Island and Eastern Bay, which is something that we and myself at Shore Rivers are looking to improve this coming year. And I want to compare that to our equity map here at Water Access. So good news for Miles Y and Eastern Bay. Uh, we have fairly, fairly good access to our rivers, which is fantastic. And what you can see, especially in the Kent Island area, uh, again, we're on all greens. So this is another reason we have a lot of opportunity to expand our swimmable shore rivers and bring more bacteria sites to this location. So I wanna encourage anyone who is listening and watching um, our presentation, if you are interested in sponsoring a site, if you're interested in adding a new location that you know a lot of people swim at in the Eastern Bay area, you know, please reach out to me and let's talk about how we can get uh, a bacteria site in this location. Again, working towards that swimmable, fishable river and making sure that everyone knows what that water quality is. So as Matt said, we're gonna talk a little bit more as well about SAV uh, and that means submerged aquatic vegetation. I would hope that many of you on the call here know what, why SAV is important, but in general, it is fantastic for water quality. It provides shelter, it provides food, it provides oxygen, it traps sediment, so it creates clearer water. It's also a carbon sink. And I, I recently learned that uh, a bed of SAV can capture more carbon than a forest can. So that's really critical for our, our fight in climate change. And it also can shelter our shorelines more, making us more resilient for climate change as well. So this is a, a goal that the state and uh, Virginia and Maryland have identified as something that we need to work towards. We need to improve our acreage in the Chesapeake Bay. So looking here, this is a chart of our map grasses from 1984 all the way to 2019. This is the entire Chesapeake Bay. So this includes Virginia. And you can see the state identified target here, 2025 target of a restored 130,000 acres. So looking at our last mapped data from 2019, we're only about 50% there. So we have some work to do. And looking even more discouragingly, I would say from 2018 to 2019, we saw a pretty big de decrease in grasses, 38%. The main reason for this is a loss in widgeon grass, um, particularly in the Southern portion of the Bay. And they think that that's probably because of poor clarity. So we have a lot of you know, storms coming in, too much sediment, and also an increase in heat. The good news is we may not necessarily see such a significant decrease in our rivers. Uh, we actually are seeing some increases, which is encouraging. So this is what the state is doing to protect these grasses. Uh, these are submerged aquatic vegetation protection zones. Essentially, these are sanctuaries for SAV, just like we have oyster sanctuaries. So this will prevent uh, certain commercial fishing, commercial fishing practices that may be damaging to SAV from happening in these beds for at least five years. Again, this is all in an effort to bring back a critical species that is gonna directly improve our water quality. Uh, shore rivers, played a really integral role in, in advocating for these SAV zones. Uh, we discovered that the zones hadn't been properly updated since 2006. So in working closely with DNR and in advocating for these updates, I'm very happy to announce that uh, last year, the 2020 update included over 16,000 acres of grasses being added to those zones and over 100 new zones. Um, a large portion of those are in the Shore Rivers watershed, Queen Anne's, Talbot, and uh, Dorchester. So that's exciting. And I, I wanna point out too on this slide, if you look at the middle miles here, you can see we have some pretty good beds going on in the middle miles. And I think that you know we might be able to say, hmm, I wonder if that is contributing to our better water quality in the middle miles. Again, these are tools, these are things that we know directly improve our water quality. So let's take a look at shore rivers specifically. So here we are, this is um, all of the mapped beds in shore rivers and then broken down specifically into each of our watersheds. Gonna talk about all of our river keepers here and not just the miles and why. But I also added these stars which show the goals 
of what we want to be at. And that's something that the state has identified that we need to get to these goals. So you can see actually the sassafras is almost there. Sassafras has a really healthy population of wild celery. But Eastern Bay, Miles Y and Chop Tank, we clearly have some work to do, right? To improve, improve our waterways, improve SAV habitat and get those acreage back up. So what are we doing for it? We have some exciting new programs at Shore Rivers to work towards this goal, particularly our watcher, SAV watcher volunteer program. So I've mentioned a few times that these grasses are mapped annually. They're mapped by the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. And that's done by an annual flyover. This happens once a year. Uh, and they are only able to map uh, that one time that they fly over. And it happens in June or July. So they might be missing some peak biomass, such as horn pond mead, which is uh, blooming right now, growing right now. So this gives us an opportunity to get out and make sure that we are getting all of the grass that we can pot that is growing and that it's going towards those sanctuaries and those SAV protection zones. So this is an opportunity for a volunteer to directly contribute that data to the state um, and provide some species diversity uh, data that the flyovers can't provide. So this is an opportunity if you're interested in becoming a volunteer with us, that we are in desperate need of volunteers for this program. All you need is a kayak, a water vessel, a paddle board, um, you know, two feet or a float, a pool noodle, you can walk out and, and look for grasses. So you can reach out to me to, to learn more about that. And then finally, I want to highlight this really exciting grant that we just received from the Chesapeake Bay Trust in partnership with the Department of Natural Resources, Anne Arundel Community College, and Washington College to establish a seed processing center at Washington College. This will essentially double restoration efforts for SAV in Maryland waters, which is really exciting. So for us, this will include seed harvesting, seed replanting, and revamping that volunteer program that I talked about. So the goal for this is in the future, you can call me and you can say, hey, Ellie, I, I really want to grow some grasses off my bulkhead in Lloyd's Creek off of, off of the Y East. And hopefully I can say, excellent, I'm going to bring over some horn pond weed seeds for you and we'll plant it and it'll directly result in more SAV in our rivers, which hopefully will therefore result in better water quality in our rivers. And so with that, I gotta end with a great photo of, um, of, of our SAV here in Claiborne. And thank you all again for watching and I'm gonna pass it back to you, Nancy. Awesome, thank you so much, Ellie. Uh, Clearly, as you can see, Ellie is a dynamic and engaging communicator, and she has put those skills to work. She's been hosting outreach events on Kent Island, which she recognized posed something of a regional gap in water quality efforts. And so she's been conducting water quality assessments there. She's been implementing restoration projects. As you heard, she's been testifying on local policy issues. And on top of all that, she recently successfully advocated for the protection of 16 thousand new acres of underwater grass habitat through the state's SAV protection zones and PS gave birth to her first child this year. So she is a very busy river keeper and we thank her for her heroism. Uh, and next we're going to go to another star river keeper, Annie Richards, who is the Chester River Keeper. Take it away, Annie. Thanks, Nancy. Good evening, everyone. I'm Annie Richards. I'm your new Chester Riverkeeper. It's such a pleasure to be working for Shore Rivers and with the amazing community members we have in the Chester watershed. I can't wait to meet more of you in person as the year progresses. If anyone can guess where I'm joining you from in the Chester River, you can throw it in the chat. I'd like to first talk with you tonight about the chlorophyll A water clarity and dissolved oxygen data captured throughout last year by your former Riverkeeper, Tim Trumbauer. So here you're looking at a heat map that's showing you the uh, chlorophyll A data from 2020. And then the graph at the top is a comparison between 2020 and 2019 data. Chlorophyll A data measures the amount of plant particulates or phytoplankton in the water. And excess phytoplankton use vast amounts of oxygen during photosynthesis, which can contribute to dead zones in our waterways. They also impact water clarity and can block sunlight from reaching those fabulous SAV beds that Ellie was just talking about. 
Acceptable levels of chlorophyll A plummeted in the mouth of the Chester last year in comparison to 2019 data. As you can see on the graph, the average pass rates in 2020 for CH1, which is our furthest downriver testing site, are 40% lower than 2019. Upriver, however, pass rates remain fairly consistent year to year in the 75 to 85% range. This is a very encouraging trend that I hope continues in 2021. Our heat map shows the headwaters of the Corsica had unusually high pass rates by about 20%. Again, these positive trends so far upriver are unusual, but very encouraging. Tom and G. Bite and Spaniard's Neck, however, saw a big dip in pass rates, going from 70% to 38%. It was really interesting and also concerning to see these downriver sites with more tidal influx from the bay with noticeably lower scores. You'll see these trends mirrored in our dissolved oxygen data for 2020. For the upper Chester, dissolved oxygen rates took a 20% hit last year. However, 2019 rates were nearly 100%, which is amazing. And so 80% is still a promising trend for 2020. High oxygen rates may be attributed to the SAD presence between Chestertown and Crumpton, which I'll address later in the presentation. Lower dissolved oxygen trends are noted by the heat map in the headwaters of Grayson Creek and in the east and west fork of Langford, averaging about 40 to 50%. Consistently low oxygen rates between both years are found along the stretch of river between Comedy Bight and Milton Point. Coincidentally, those are also areas of the river that have decidedly less active SAD beds. For clarity, clarity in the main stem of the Chester River was down 20% this year, with the exception of Milton Point and upriver between the Country Club and Chestertown. These areas of the river have the greatest depth in the channel by far, with Milton Point's depth reaching 75 feet, and the Chestertown to Country Club channel reaching 20 to 25 feet. Rainfall, of course, largely impacts water quality, and the Eastern Shore did experience higher regional rain events compared to the rest of the Chesapeake. However, the overall downriver trends in clarity, oxygen, and chlorophyll could also suggest perhaps a larger impact from the bay this year, as well as inflow from the Conowingo Dam. So bacteria, last year, Kim monitored 13 sites for bacterial data in the Chester River. Popular raft up sites such as Cackaway Island in Langford, Conquest Beach on Spaniard's Neck, the Corsica River Yacht Club, and Rolf Wharf Marina had 95% pass rates over the entire summer, which was very good news for everyone who was wrapping up and swimming there. Popular fishing sites such as Chestertown Waterfront, Centerville Wharf, and Skinner's Neck Landing had slightly lower pass rates, passing 60 to 94% of the time. Morgan Creek and Duck Neck, however, were bacteria hotspots for the Chester, passing less than 60% of the time. This coming year's bacteria monitoring program will shift to a new volunteer community science program called Swim Testers. Volunteers will test weekly at public access points along the shoreline where fishing, swimming, and common recreational activities take place, as opposed to testing in the middle of the channel where there's a greater dilution potential of bacteria. I'm really excited to see this program take off and I look forward to growing our site locations year to year, as well as using this data, which has such a large impact on human health to reach as many audiences as possible. So as Matt and Ellie were saying, our bacteria and our swimmable shore rivers program relate so much to public access and equitable, uh, equitable public access. As shore rivers looks at public access opportunities in our rivers, DNR can be a good guide for finding locations near you. Indeed, looking at this map of access points in the river, it would appear that public access is not an issue at the Chester at all. However, when you consider our rural character and the inherent realities, you may reconsider, especially when thinking about access to personal vehicles, ownership of personal boats or trailers. Here's what happens to viable public access points when you, have, when you do not have your own car or your own boat. As you can see, the available public access goes down by more than half. Most of the remaining access points are still geared toward kayaks or canoes and offer no beaches or fishing piers. Most of these sites are more than one mile walk from any major established community. Making sure all our community members in the Chester watershed have equitable access to our waterway is a priority in the Eastern Shore and in Shore Rivers. 
SAV. Ellie gave such a great overview of the exciting SAV projects coming down the line. Here is a map of protected zone in the lower Chester around Eastern Neck Island and Swan Creek. We have some wonderful stands with SAV, including some redhead grasses, which is captured in the photo below. Not pictured in this chart, however, are the exceptional stands of wild celery that you can find along the Kent and Queen Anne's County shore between just north of the Chester River Bridge all the way up to Crumpton and beyond. Uh, I'm really looking forward to next week actually going out with DNR to help establish new celery beds in Rosin Creek as well as Southeast Creek. And I'm very excited to keep you updated on that score to see how they take off. Another update I'd love to give you is stormwater management. In 2019, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation funded a creation of Chestertown's Comprehensive Stormwater Management Plan, which was created by former Riverkeeper Tim. On the Eastern Shore, which is peppered with small historic towns that were designed to send water down streets and into the river as fast as possible, it can be costly and complicated to retrofit communities with river-friendly stormwater solutions. This document that is being created is a living document identifying key areas for green stormwater retrofit. There are over 30 sites currently listed. It includes an interactive GIS atlas demonstrating site locations, proposed plans, and it will track nutrient load reductions as we complete these projects. As we work to complete final edits to the plan and final tweaks and finishing touches on the atlas, we hope to formally present this plan to the town council this summer and really look forward to sharing it with you all. Uh, so with that, thanks. And I'm going to hand it back over to Nancy. Thank you so much, Annie. Um, or should I say Captain Annie? Because yes, she is a licensed captain. Uh, she has a lifetime of experience on the Chester which shines through in uh, her work and in her presentation. She actually started as the Chester Riverkeeper just a few days after the legislative session began this year, but she jumped right in, no pun intended. She provided influential verbal testimony on key river protection issues and looking for funding for her work by submitting a National Fish and Wildlife Foundation grant. So thank you, Annie, and welcome aboard. Um, before we get to our next river keeper, I want to remind you very quickly that if you have any questions, please type them in the chat because we will be getting to them soon. We've already gotten a bunch of great questions, but we'd love to solicit more. Uh, we are now going to go last but not least to Zach Kelleher, who is the river keeper for the Sassafras. Zach, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Nancy. Uh, between my fellow river keepers and our special guests tonight, I definitely have very, very tough acts to follow, but I think I'm up for the challenge. Before I dive in, I just want to highlight one of our biggest uh, success stories and one of the things that I'm most excited about from this past year. Um, it was a very tough year, as you've heard from my fellow river keepers, um, for a variety of reasons, and our rivers really took the brunt of a lot of these issues. But one of the uh, lights through all of the darkness was the fact that this was the first ever year that we monitored a full season of water quality parameters on the Bayside Creeks, which is an internal name that we came up with for the four uh, creeks in Kent County that are kind of on the Chesapeake Bay uh, in that region between the Sassafras and Chester. And that's Silpon Creek, Churn Creek, Horton Creek, and Fairley Creek. And so this was really the first year that any watershed organization or any organization at all really represented this region and gave these communities and these people a seat at the table. And so I was really honored to be chosen to be that voice, um, not just for the Sassafras, but also for the Bayside Creeks region. And so I'm really excited that we have a full year of data now for the Bayside Creeks. Another thing that was another win for the Bayside Creeks specifically is we were awarded funding through the Chesapeake Bay Trust Program to, um, to do a watershed assessment for this entire region of, of these four creeks. And so this is really gonna inform all of our restoration and outreach efforts over the next five to 10 years. And that effort and that analysis is going on right now and should be wrapping up uh, within the next year or so. And I also do just want to provide a thank you um, to all the community members from the Bayside Creeks area who participated in my town halls, uh, have reached out to me or have had conversations with me or emailed me. Uh, all of that knowledge and um, opinions and input has been really valuable as we've developed these programs in this area. And so diving right in to the same three parameters that my fellow riverkeepers have spoken about, dissolved oxygen, clarity, and chlorophyll, 
I put it in the specific order because for the Sassafras and Bayside Creeks, it's really the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so for dissolved oxygen, you can see here that all of the creeks and the entire river did really well for dissolved oxygen, uh, which is pretty consistent. We saw some decreases around the, the communities on the Sassafras, like Kentmore Park and Shorewood Estates. But other than that, on the whole, um, dissolved oxygen was pretty consistent and very healthy um, throughout the entire sampling season. Getting to the ugly was water clarity. And so you can see that the Sassafras, more than half of the river did very poor in terms of water clarity. Um, all the way up from Ordinary Point, all the way up past Fox Hole Land into the headwaters, really struggled and only got a 33% uh, pass rate, uh, which is a very significant decrease from years past. Uh, Bayside Creeks did okay. It was kind of a mixed bag. Still Pond and Churn did pretty well. They had a majority pass rate. Unfortunately, Wharton and Fairley Creeks um, didn't do so well. They did about as poorly as the Upper Sassafras did. Um, I have, we have a few guesses or, or, or beliefs of why this is, but we're waiting for this land use analysis as part of the grant funding to kind of get a better handle on what could be contributing to these um, parameters and these results in the Bayside Creeks area. Finally, uh, chlorophyll A, this was the ugly one this year in the Sassafras in particular. You can see similar to water clarity, more than half of the river did very poorly and was in that C to D range. Um, this is directly because of the harmful algal bloom that I'm sure most of you remember um, from this past summer. And that really, uh, the, the orange parts there on the map really show exactly where the worst spots of that algal bloom was. And I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, same thing with the Bayside Creeks. It was kind of a mixed bag again. Still Pond and Churn Creek did really well, um, or did better um, in terms of chlorophyll A. Warren Creeks and Farrelly Creeks didn't do so well. Um, and there, there was a major sewage leak on Farrelly Creek um, that we responded to. I would imagine that contributed pretty significantly to that failing grade, but we're going to look more into that uh, over the coming months. And so, as many of you remember, this is what the, most of the sassafras looked like this past summer um, because of, due to the harmful algal bloom that we had. Uh, it was the longest lasting, largest, and most toxic bloom we've ever recorded on the river, which was pretty staggering and pretty upsetting. The bloom really started in uh, early summer and lasted to about mid-fall, and it stretched from right around uh, Turner's Creek, an ordinary point, all the way up to the headwaters and everywhere in between. And this is, the water looked like this, which really was detrimental to the health of the waterways, to recreation opportunities, to our commercial fisheries, to our property owners, and to everybody. And so you can really see here, looking at this specific water quality station, which is right by Ordinary Point, you can see right in June, where the amount of chlorophyll and algae in the water took off and the amount of dissolved oxygen in the water declined and plummeted. And it continued all the way until mid-September when finally the oxygen ran out. It was completely consumed by all of the algae. But it still took over a month from that point between we, but before we got back to a, a more natural equilibrium and the bloom finally subsided after 12 and a half weeks because the water got cooler. And so this was really a tough summer for the, for the sassafras. And the cause of these blooms is coming from within the watershed. It's coming from all of our, uh, all of our land use, all of our communities, and in conjunction with the impact of climate change that we're seeing. And so we are gearing up and building out a monitoring program and our response to these harmful algal blooms because we're going to continue to see their frequency and their intensity increase as the climate continues to change. This is our bacteria monitoring stations on the Sassafras and the Bayside Creeks. And they did pretty well, actually. Uh, we did have our first ever failing sites, but even then it was only once or twice during the seasons. And it was immediately after really, really significant rainfalls. We continue to see rain events that are very intense and don't last a long time. So, and it just inundates the creeks and we get failing bacteria for the next 24 to 48 hours after these rain events. And so as my former fellow river keepers have said, if anybody's interested in getting involved 
with the swim test or bacteria monitoring program. We are looking for volunteers, and we are hoping to expand the number of sites and our testing frequency as well. So contact uh, myself or Annie if you're interested in getting involved with that. Here's the public access points on the Sassafras and Bayside Creeks. And you can see on top of that, the, the monitoring sites for our bacteria program as well. But when you overlay the equity and the access maps, you can see that we do have a problem. And it's very tough for community members throughout the Bayside Creeks and Sassafras watersheds to actually get out and access this water in a publicly available locations. And so that's something, seeing it this, laid out this starkly is really a wake up call and something that we really wanna to work to improve and fix because the more we can get people out on these waterways, the more we can get them invested in the work that we're doing and get them to care about the health and the more empowered and inspired stewards we have, the quicker we can clean up our waterways. And it was pretty interesting when we compared across our watersheds the Sassafras had about 14.9 miles on average between access points, which was the greatest distance between access points of any of the watersheds. And so we need to work to change that and get more equitable and more accessible public access points throughout the Sassafras and Bayside Creeks. A brief Conowingo Dam update. Um, we did renew our legislative efforts at the state and federal levels. But unfortunately, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission finally issued their ruling on the proposed settlement after sitting on it for a year and a half. And unfortunately, they approved it as is, which meant the flawed settlement agreement that came out in October of 2019 went ahead with all of the issues that we've been fighting. And so for now, our, our strategy is shifting to the courts and the legal battles. And so we're going to be trying to tackle it. And we've asked the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to, for a rehearing. And we're hopeful that we can try to get some better water quality protections and get some more accountability across the board. Attacking this issue from another level, we've also been submitting comments for the watershed implementation plan that's being developed specifically for Conowingo, which just got drafted and released this spring and should be finalized uh, in the coming months. And I do want to thank everybody who submitted comments and testimony and helped really show how much this impact, how much this issue impacts the Eastern Shore. And to end on a high note, I just also want to talk about the submerged aquatic vegetation. This was a really great year for the sassafras. We planted four acres and had the highest germination and success rate of any of Shore River's waterways. And we also had some tremendous wild celery grass beds, especially in the lower reaches of the river, that according to the Department of Natural Resources, were some of the healthiest and largest grass beds in the entire bay this year. And so over the course of a few days, we had multiple harvesting opportunities, and we were able to collect over 4 million wild celery seeds from the sassafras. And so thanks in part to the grant that Ellie wrote um, to develop the turbulator program with Washington College, that's going to allow us to plant over 10 acres of wild celery throughout the sassafras and Bayside Creeks this upcoming year, which will be happening uh, in the next month or so. And so I also want to reiterate the need for volunteers to help us monitor these beds, to help us harvest and plant. So if you're interested in getting involved with that, please let me know. And with that, I will turn it back over to Nancy and open it up to the questions and discussions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zach. Uh, you know, he's known to his fellow river keepers as the water chestnut warrior because he worked so hard to get rid of this invasive and destructive plant along the Sassafras River. And he's really been an integral part of several large scale restoration projects and he has Butcher River is actually in the news with his work on Conowingo Dam related issues. So kudos to Zach. Uh, you know, he grew up wading in the salty waters around Tillman Island, but Zach and his fiance have acclimated to the fresh waters uh, north of, of Tillman. They are now putting down some non invasive roots as brand new homeowners in Millington. So congratulations to them. And thanks to all of our four river keepers for doing everything that you do for us. You all have to be scientists and educators and leaders and coordinators and public speakers and advocacy experts and captains and, and Zoom presenters all wrapped into one. And you've shown that when we work together, conservation can be incredibly rewarding. Um, and I want to make a plug. If those of you who are watching right now are as inspired by this work as I am, please consider donating by going to Shore Rivers. Dot org. Every gift is put to work 
and leveraged into action for cleaner water. And now yeah. we're going to have a chance to hear from the river keepers uh, who will be answering your questions that you have been posing to them throughout the course of this presentation. Feel free to keep sending them to us in the chat box if you want to. If you have to leave, thank you so much for coming. Uh, apologies in advance if we can't get to every single question on the list, but we are going to send an email follow-up and post some information on the website to hopefully address any questions that don't get answered tonight. Uh, and with that, Matt, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you again, Nancy. Thank you, Anne, for those incredible words. Um, thank you, Nick, for being such a good steward of our watershed and our, and our Eastern Shore resources. And thank everybody for coming today and, and joining us on a a rainy Friday evening. Um, hopefully one day we'll get beyond this Zoom interaction and we can celebrate again with um, beers and oysters like we once did uh, for these State of the Rivers events in the past. Um, but let's dive into some questions. So I appreciate everybody who, who sent over some questions. We have about eight of them, so it's not a huge amount and I think we can get through those pretty quickly. Um, but before I do, I wanna do a, just a quick uh, poll in the chat. So I want to hear from all of you on the on the Zoom call today, what watershed you're from or what watershed you most like to enjoy and recreate on. And then secondly, what are you most excited about for this summer and getting out on our rivers? Tell us what you love to do on these waterways and why you call them home. And while we're doing that, I'm going to roll into some of these questions here. And I'm going to start from the north of our region with Zach and then work our way back down to the um, infamous chop tank here. So Zach, thanks for, for a great presentation and, and really outlining uh, the, the, the health of the, the, the Sassafras River from 2020 and how, how the land resources are impacting the river and, and how the, the Conomingo Dam is impacting the river. Uh, a couple questions that came in for you. First, why was there such poor water quality in the Sassafras with the best grass beds? Is there a correlation there that you can talk about? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, the main reason is that most of these grass beds that we see on the Sassafras were in the lower river. And so that's where we saw the healthiest uh, parameters and that's where we saw the best water quality. And that's partially, that's for a variety of reasons, but part of the reason the grasses were thriving down there was because that's where the healthy, healthiest water quality was versus the algal bloom that was going on for most of the season and most of the summer was further upriver um, from ordinary point and up. And so, when that algae bloom was in full swing, the clar water clarity was terrible. It was choked out with way too many nutrients. Um, and it just was an awful habitat for grasses or any native species really to grow in there. And so it, it kind of demonstrates the, the dichotomy of a lot of our riverine systems and how parts of the river can do really well and other parts need some help. And so with this expanded grass program, uh, the Submerged Aquatic Vegetation Program, we're hoping that we can increase the number of plantings upriver to try to act as nature's tums, as they call it, um, to try to kind of clean up and balance um, and get the, e the equilibrium back to the ecosystem. That's great. That's good to understand. You know, when we're talking about the health of the river, there is a difference between the upper and the lower and what influences the water quality in those areas. So. That's a great um, point to emphasize there. Secondly, being that you are probably the most experienced fisherman of the, the four of us, um, this one is, is, is directly related to the invasive snakehead population. So there's no question that the river keepers are focused on water quality. We are the voice of clean water on the Eastern shore and that is our priority. But the question here is from a fishery standpoint, is there any monitoring or collaboration with other agencies to monitor the invasive snakehead population? Yeah, that's an awesome question. Um, because it's becoming so relevant and there's increasing attention on the issue um, as snakehead and other invasive species continue to spread through our waterways. And so the fact of the matter is we do have documented cases of snakehead and blue catfish and um, a few other varieties of invasive fish in the sassafras and every single one of our other waterways here on the eastern shore so we do work with department of natural resources uh, and a few other state agencies and local agencies who are kind of trying to monitor and keep a uh, keep tabs on these invasive populations but really the most reliable and the best source of information since i don't have enough time in the day to go out and fish for them myself in my off time whenever that is 
um, is really just the fishermen that are out there, the homeowners that are seeing them and the people that are reporting them to me um, and our other river keepers. And so if you see something out there, please send us a picture, let us know where you're seeing it. Um, and right now our commercial watermen are really the ones doing the heavy lifting for getting these invasives out of there and keeping the most active pulse on these invasives. Um, so they're out there, the invasives are out there, make sure you're going out after them because Unlike water chestnut and some of the other invasives that we're fighting on land and up the creeks a little further, snakehead and blue cat are two of the best eating fish in the bay. And so it's a pretty win-win situation when you're helping the bay and getting a full stomach on something that's delicious. Yeah, there's no doubt when you can do um, both of those, it's a win-win. And I'm sure a lot of the folks on the call today can really relate to um, their enjoyment of just of, of uh, being able to, to enjoy and to celebrate the, the different species and the tastes and flavors of the, of the Chesapeake Bay, uh, which you mentioned there. So thank you, Zach. Um, everyone, keep an eye out for Zach. Uh, you know, just in the past two years, he's done an incredible job at putting himself on the front lines of the Conowingo Dam issue. And we're gonna be rocking and rolling with um, some efforts that we have uh, legally to, to, to um, address the the, the pollution coming out of the Conowingo. So stay tuned with, with Zach for more information on that as we progress in, on that issue. Jumping down the river to the Chester, Annie, our newest river keeper, and one who has impressed all of us with her legislative work this past session, as Nancy mentioned, just diving right in with two feet on, on testifying on equity bills and, and public access and, and the Clean Water Commerce Act, which Ann, Ann helped to pioneer and, and to really champion moving forward um, for a lot of great funding resources for the work that we're doing. So thank you, Anne and Annie, for, for, for the work on all of that. So Annie, the question I have here for you today, staying on that policy um, theme here, is do shore rivers have a position on the third Bay Bridge crossing? And being that that's um, covering a lot of your watershed there and, and could potentially impact the, the, the water quality in that watershed, I'm gonna have you answer this one. Absolutely. So yeah, this is something that we get asked about a lot these days, especially because the NEPA study has just come out. Um, a new Chesapeake Bay crossing would be very detrimental to our wetlands, to sediment, uh, disturbing sediments. It would be incredibly harmful to the habitats and water quality, um, SAV beds, increased traffic. Um, so we have a strong stance against it. Um, Running a third crossing through Kent Island when we're thinking about the effects of climate change and thinking about uh, resiliency opportunities for the eastern shore and thinking about how close to the water's edge highways already lay within Kent Island uh, doesn't seem like a winning solution to us. Um, and to create a new third span in a totally new habitat or a totally new corridor, whether that be uh, south of Kent Island or north in the Chester, would be just incredibly destructive to the newly protected SAV zones that Ellie just demonstrated and uh, to the wetlands that exist that provide so much filtration for stormwater runoff that's coming from a lot of uh, residential areas. So that's key transitional area that we need and it's key transitional area that we need as sea level rises to allow for marsh migration to help protect our shoreline. So giving that up for more transportation when there are so many advancements being made in broadband in alternative transportation methods this is not a winning strategy for us on the eastern shore and it's not a winning strategy for our waterways yeah that's, that's a great point and not to put you on the spot but there is a public hearing coming up for the third bay bridge right and that's an opportunity for everyone on the call here to sort of weigh in and provide their their input and their concerns um, over whether or not a third bay bridge should happen at all and if it does, you know, where and how. Absolutely, and I'll, I'll be there. So anyone else who's planning to join, you can always reach out to me if you have specific questions um, or further input that you'd like Shore Rivers to consider when we, when we represent. That's great. Yeah. Okay, and one more question for you, Annie, while we have you. This is a, this is a good one, and this is one that I think all the other river keepers have gotten for some time, so I'm excited to see how you answer this one. Uh, but the, 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 the question that was posed here is, I've had a lot of people tell me that 40 years ago they could see the bottom of the Chester River at points. The water was so clear. Now the Chester seems always to be brown and muddy. How do we explain this? This is a really big question. This is 
kind of this huge question that's at the center of all the work that we're doing across all of these rivers, because there's so many cofactors that we're considering when we're talking about why water isn't clear. And depending on where you grew up, because a lot of these anecdotal stories of, you know, when I was growing up, I saw it clear in this place, or I saw SAV beds in this place. Well, that also depends on where you were in the river, because the river is an ever-changing body. And if you're at the Chester River Bridge, looking straight down, I'd say probably, you know, 300 days out of 301, you're going to see a really muddy river. But I've also spent time in the last three years wading six feet deep in Grayson Creek, seeing my toes, seeing diversity of SAV beds there when the year before, I, you know, that never would have been the case. So we're, there's two different conversations here. There's the scientific conversation that we have real runoff situations to combat. Because when we have more sediment going into our rivers, more phosphorus and nitrogen pollution, that's making the waters less hospitable to support SAV beds that once thrived 40 years ago on the Chester, on the Chester River. Now, we're starting to see a resurgence of that, which is really positive, and that's helping to make gains. Uh, but certain species are a lot more uh, sensitive than others. Uh, and so they need the water quality to improve a little bit before they can then thrive and then help bolster that. Um, oyster reef depletion, we used to have a, a really stable and, you know, a plethora of oysters on the Chester River, a lot of different beds that have been depleted over the years, but we're seeing muscle resurgences on those, which, you know, for, for good or for bad, depending on whether they're native or invasive, they are filtering water. We are seeing uh, oysters that uh, set, which is also helping to restore uh, water quality. But all of this is a balancing game. And as soon as you move one piece of the puzzle over with a huge rainstorm event or um, a huge rain, an unlucky time rainstorm right after, you know, fields have been killed or a new residential uh, community is being built, it, it offsets the balance. And so there's a, all of these answers come up to why the Chester River is predominantly muddy now when it needs to be clear. But also anecdotally, I can tell you that uh, if you're ever feeling jaded or unhopeful about the state of the Chester, the more you can get out on the water and see it in different places than you're used to, the better off you'll be. Because there are so many places I've seen year to year that have had such dramatic changes week to week. Um, and so the more you can get out on your kayak, the more you can get out on a boat, the more you can get down to Eastern Neck Island with Conquest Beach. Um, the more you'll start to change your mind about that and start to see how this change in clarity is happening, not just year to year, but day to day. Yeah, that's a great question. I really like that point. The more you get out on the river and places you haven't been, I would just add, the better steward you can be. As an individual, as a member of Shore Rivers, your experience on these waterways are important and valuable to supporting the work that the four of us are doing as we advocate for cleaner water, clean water protections. So I second that, and I'll just say too, the, the thing that stacks on top of all those pressures that you mentioned is climate change. And as we continue to see more, more intense and more frequent rainfalls, as we potentially see growing seasons extended even longer and more fertilizers being applied on residential and agricultural land, we can expect more of those nutrients to enter into our waterways. So, it's, it's an uphill battle from here when you add climate change on top of that. But I can see all my Riverkeeper's faces now and we're not giving up hope or the fight. So stick with us as we continue to work on this. Thanks, Amy. So next I want to bring Ellie Bassett back to the screen, back to the stage here. Ellie, our resident SAV queen and also a professional in so many different ways here on policy and advocacy work water quality monitoring, and getting grants and putting in projects. I think uh, you saw the, the slide where Ellie talked about the SAV grant that we have for this year and next year. This is um, the first of its kind. We, we tried to get this grant funded many times before uh, without success, but it took Ellie to, to step up and really develop a robust program on how we can plant and monitor and restore SAV in our rivers. So sticking on that theme, can you share a little bit about the economics of the SAV planting program? Yeah, that's a, a great question. I think, you know, when you think about SAV, you think about all these ecological benefits, right? But you don't realize that tied into that 
we have these major economic benefits and societal benefits associated with it, those SAV beds as well. So, um, you know, when you think about the traditional SAV bed, I, I hope everyone pictures as Matt and Annie were talking about, you know, this beautiful, clear habitat, and we have soft shell crabs getting in there. We have, um, you know, it's essentially a nursery for baby fishes, our baby fish. So um, all of this is directly benefiting our fisheries. And we need to remind ourselves that without this critical habitat, it's going to make a, a pretty significant impact on all of those fisheries. You know, our ecosystem is all connected to each other. So Benefiting our, our SAB is only going to benefit those those systems up the tier, right? Up up the tier and, and, and our economy, everyone knows that Maryland is known for our blue crabs, we're known for our rockfish. All of that is tied directly to this critical habitat. And even more so if you think about our aesthetic uh, benefits that this SAB provides, we act as a, a tourist hotspot, all of that again relates back to clear water quality. And, and in order to have that clear water, we need to have our SAV. And finally, I think looking long-term, you know, SAV is a huge benefit when we're talking about climate change. And it's, it's no secret that the Eastern shore is, is at, at threat to climate change, especially you know areas in the chop tanks and Miles River in particular, St. Michael's, it's, it's um, not uncommon to be some sunny day flooding these days and and that's a concern so when we think about these heavy storm events that we're frequent you know experiencing more frequently SAB is going to protect those shorelines better so again the more we invest in in bringing these grasses back the more value and we're also going to get out of it and I hope that answers the question but in thinking about future at shore rivers work you know uh, we don't have all the wheels together yet and how we can turn this SAV seed processing system, which is called a turbulator, which is a great name, how we can turn that into this, this opportunity for homeowners to make this investment in SAV. But I think that that is also, you know, a, a really exciting link and, and future connection for Shore Rivers that hopefully we can work towards. Yeah, I think we're all in agreement that we can't have enough SAV in our rivers when it when it um, relates to the water quality benefits and the the um, resiliency against climate change, which we're all try, uh, working to to achieve in, in each of our waterways. And so I, I sort of see it's those ecosystem services that you mentioned that most of us think about when we see SAV, but those ecosystem services turn into economic benefits when we talk about our commercial and recreational fishing. Um, our waterfront properties, real estate, recreational um, uses of our waterways, the list goes on. And all of that is, is um, benefited by the underwater grasses that we have in our rivers. So um, great answer, thank you. The, the last questions that we have here are related to bacteria. And one of them was directed directly towards my slide for a, a quick clarification. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen real quick. And while I do that, I'm going to answer a couple questions and let me see here. Can I get a head nod on the screen share? Did that work? All right, we got the, the bacteria monitoring back up. So um, here's our monitoring program in the chop tank, as you see, and I showed these graphs and somebody um, was, was quick to notice that the red line actually changes from the Denton scale to what we have on Hamburg's Bay Beach, where it's a 35 unit measurement for the water quality standard. And great question. The reason that Hambrook's Bay has a 35 um, most probable number standard for water quality, where Denton and most of our other sites have 104 uh, water quality standard is because the EPA has two protocols for collecting and analyzing bacteria um, data in, in your waterways. And the first is, is, is referenced here in Denton where you collect one sample at a site and you compare the results of that one sample to the 104 standard. When we move down to Hamburg's Bay, this is where the second protocol comes in play and it's a little more stringent. And what it requires is that you collect three samples per site and you take the geometric mean of those samples and you compare that to the 35 most probable number standard there. And the reason that they chose to do three standards, the sponsor of this site is really interested in turning the beaches around Cambridge into swimmable beaches. 
And so they're investing the funds to do the more rigorous testing here so that we can get a better idea of where these bacteria sources are actually um, coming from and how we can address those. And that comes to the, the, the last question we have here was exactly how much do we know about where the bacteria is coming from? And I'd say this is a, 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 it's a great question and it leads right into one that we've been grappling with for the past couple of years. And so our, our, our intention first of starting this monitoring program was to um, get an understanding of where the hotspots are for poor water quality and, or for, for poor bacteria readings, I, I, I should say. And once we have this data, the next natural step is to identify what are the sources that are impacting these specific areas. And it could be from leaking sewer lines in urban areas and cities. It could be septic systems in, in, in more rural areas along our waterfront. Uh, wastewater treatment plant discharges from both the municipalities, our local towns, and then also our private industries who have wastewater discharge permits as well. And then you can't rule out wildlife and domestic animals too. You know, we have a lot of wildlife, a lot of geese, a lot of deer that, that frequent our shoreline. And we have a lot of pets too. Uh, we all like to take our dogs down to the water to cool off on a hot summer day. And, you know, not cleaning up after your pet can, can actually cause a bacteria issue in that local water uh, nearby there. So as river keepers, our next step, now that we have a, a pretty good understanding of what sites are, are hot in terms of, of high bacteria reading, is to identify what these sources are. And we piloted an effort last year working with a lab to do eDNA source tracking. And so the idea here is that if we collect a sample of, for, and process it for bacteria, and we get a high reading of bacteria, and then we collect another sample at that same site to test for the environmental DNA in the water to identify what the source could be, whether it's, whether it's canine, whether it's human, poultry, and a whole variety of different indicators, we can then start to compare, well, if we're having a high bacteria reading and we're getting a lot of eDNA from, let's say, canine, then we can start to make connections on what's happening at that beach there. And so we're going we're gonna to amplify that source tracking program this year as we continue to um, look for, for ways to address the bacteria pollution in our local waterways. So with that, that wraps up the, the questions that, we, that we've that we got um, from all of you. And, and thank you for everyone who stuck around. I know we, we went over our time a little bit, but we appreciate you holding tight through the technical difficulties. And we really appreciate your, your support and your attention to our work here at Shore Rivers. And so from, from all of us, river keepers and all the staff and the, and the clean water advocates that work every day to protect our local waterways, I wanna say thank you. Um, from the bottom of my heart and turn it back to Nancy to, to bring us home. Thank you so much, Matt. You all are amazing. Honestly, I would watch a weekly Riverkeeper show and you don't even need me because Matt has the hosting skills down. I mean, it, you know, he's, he's nailed it. So thank you so much to you and Matt and Ellie and, and Annie and Zach. Um, and thank you to everyone who uh, was with us this evening for choosing to spend your Friday evening with me and with River Keepers and Shore Rivers. I hope you've all enjoyed this event and learned a little bit too. If you have a question that wasn't answered, Matt's gonna post an FAQ on shorerivers.org with some follow-up information. And remember your River Keepers contact info is on the website as well. So you can feel free to follow up with them directly. Uh, congratulations again to our award winner, Nick Carter for his accomplishments in environmental stewardship. and. Uh, a final note, you may want to jot this down. The Shore River Solstice Celebration is going to take place from June 20th to June 26th. Next month, June 20th to June 26th, we're offering extraordinary experiences with local experts that give participants a closer look at how science, advocacy, restoration, and education combine for cleaner water and a safer future for everyone. So register and learn more at shorerivers.org slash events. And of course, if you were inspired by what you heard here tonight, please visit shorerivers.org slash donate. The link is also in the chat box. Uh, thank you all again and have a great weekend. See you later. <laughs>